I'd like to start, Monica, by thanking you for being able to participate in this global project. As I mentioned, we'll talk for about an hour, starting with your personal history, your work during the revolution, and we'll end up talking about the work that you're doing now. I know that you're a very highly regarded public figure, and you are renowned for being a commander during the war. But I'd like you to go back to the beginning and tell me a little bit about your personal history, your childhood, your earliest memories. I come from a middle-class family, even though my parents come from very humble beginnings. My father was able to study law, and later he became a cotton producer, so that by the time I was an adolescent, we were in a comfortable economic position. So I studied, um, therefore, in a private religious school. And from a very young age, I showed a tendency to protect the poor, um, a social sensibility. I, was, I would get involved with the events that the nuns organized to collect clothing for the poor, for the poor, poor children. And then in this way, I came into contact at a very young age with social inequality, with inequity, with injustice. It really bothered me to see the situation of workers, of the children who would um, come to cut cotton at my father's haciendas. And I tried to do something for them. And that's why I, I would become involved in um, activities of social character. I think um, a nun who was my sociology teacher um, was um, the person who pushed me to question myself about the injustices. And I believe this led me to some activities at a very early age. Excuse me. I have to drink some water. I studied in a very exclusive school. And there was discrimination towards people with with less money, of a social, lower social status. And this made me rebel a little bit against this attitude toward inequality, to question the Christian discourse versus the Christian practice. And then when I was 14 or 15 years old, I became involved in my first political activities. My first big action was um, to, a, a march to demand um, the freedom of Doris Tijerino. She was a um, guerrilla woman who had been captured and she had been raped, humiliated, and she appeared with um, bruises, um, showing the bruises from her captures, the, the marks of the aggression that she had suffered. So we mobilized with the school to protest and to demand her freedom. And later I organized at my school to demand, um, for example, better salaries for our teachers, um, in 1967, there was a big strike. I was uh, 15 years old at the time, and we became involved um, on this strike to back up our teachers. And later, in what we called what were called um, school takeovers, that we would take over a school and interrupt classes in order to demand freedom for the political prisoners. This led, um, led to the accusations against me from some of the nuns who were, who were very reactionary and who started to accuse me of being red, communist, even though all of my first actions I did um, as part of a youth movement 
and we expressed ourselves as a Christian youth movement, and that together we were going through a process of reflection about the necessity of political action in order to change the conditions in Nicaragua. And, well, that's it. Uh, well, in this effort, we actually found ourselves with the Marxists, with the Student Revolutionary Movement, the Revolutionary Student Front. And this coincided, um, this coincided with a movement of reflection throughout the world about the role of Christians um, regarding the injustices in the world. We're talking about the letters um, that obligated that priests and other religious leaders to reflect about the injustice in the world. The Second Vatican Council, um, the, the Latin American Episcopal Conference in Medellin that had an impact in what was later called the popular church or liberation theology. The youth um, gravitated around all of this. Young guys and young girls who were organized in the Christian youth movement and later were connected to the Sandinista Front for National Liberation. And how did you rise to such a high position within the Sandinistas? Well, um, we, were, we first became involved um, with a, a Sandinista Front effort to develop organizations that would permit it to connect to the popular sectors. Um, intermediary organizations is um, what, what they were called, and they even theorized about the role of intermediary organizations. And the Christian movement played the role of an intermediary organization. So we would go to the barrios to do social work and at the same time to raise awareness and to recruit. And in this work, we, um, we played a leadership role. We, had, um, we were part of the executive committee of the Christian movement and we began to have a um, dialogue at a high level with the leadership of the Sandinista Front. And yeah, through this work, I, I was forced to go underground a little prematurely. Um, in 1974, there was an, um, an assault on Chema Castillo's house. Um, it was a, a collective, massive seizure. Um, and a young woman who I had recruited um, was selected to participate in this operation. So then her mother, when she realized that her daughter had joined the guerrilla struggle, um, she, she filed a report against me. She went, um, she despaired and she went to the National Guard, to Somoza's security, to say that I had recruited her daughter and that, um, and so I had to go underground at a you know, pretty early. And um, through my underground work, well, I got to have political and military responsibilities. When, um, when the ri revolution triumphed, I had already been imprisoned for one year. I had participated in different political and military actions. And I uh, became part of the general security staff of Managua, the capital. D the, during the first part, I was in the north, in Ocotal, in Esteli, in Matagalpa. But when I was imprisoned, um, then uh, they didn't t t send me back to the north. I, I stayed in Managua. And I was part of the political military directive of Managua. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me how, as a woman, you rose to such a high rank? Um, well, it helped that I had participated as a director of a movement that had its own force. Um, it also helped that I had um, received formal education. Um, another thing that helped was that the, the leaders 
who were directly in charge of me, um, supervised me, they uh, valued my capacity, my um, disposition to, to get the work done. Um, I think that I had um, certain qualities. I mean, I had uh, the innate gift of leadership that I developed in school, in college, in the Christian uh, movement. And well, um, they were recognized within the structure of the Sandinista Front. You see, I, I, I played the role of uh, director in the tasks they assigned to me. And I fully committed myself. Um, and so this was recognized to continue assuming more and more responsibilities. What was the title of your position? Um, in the north, I was responsible for political organizing in Ocotal. Um, later, I was director of the whole region. I was in charge of the north region, um, Esteli, Nueva Segovia, Madrid. Mm, later, uh, they gave me responsibilities in Matagalpa, um, where our task was to organize um, create supply networks um, to militarily um, direct small combat units for small actions. And sincerely, I feel that um, my condition as a woman did not create um, particular difficulties for me. More accurately, there were some collaborators or women who always thought that men had to have certain prerogatives. But um, from an organizational point of view, I didn't have um, any difficulties. And once I was in charge, um, such as at the end of the fight, um, I was in charge of a battalion with which we organized the capture of Granada, well, um, there was a recognition of the of women's role, and any difficulties really uh, became secondary. I think that um, this is a stage when we had less difficulty than later after the triumph of the revolution. And why were you imprisoned? Um, well, I was reported. Um, someone had inf infiltrated um, our group, and when we, as we were going to a meeting, they shot at us. I was, I was able to come out alive, but um, the next day, when I tried to um, go, get to a safety house, they followed me. Um, they saw that I was a stranger um, that was leaving a peasant area, and I didn't look like a peasant. And so they um, ambushed me and, and captured me. A year is a long time. How did you cope during that time? Well, um, we, we had such strong conviction. Um, there were comrades who stayed so many more years, eight, five, six years. Um, we really, we were there for a really short time, having only been there for one year. And we, we endured it very well. Uh, we continued the fight from within the prison, converting the prison uh, into trenches, because we, we found ourselves um, a group of women, and we became very organized. Um, we were, uh, I, I personally uh, recruited female police officers uh, to collaborate with our cause. We had a very big capacity for persuasion, and we converted the jail into uh, the trenches, and this allowed us to endure. I, I, I want to tell you that while I was underground, I made the decision to become a mother. And it was kind of a risky decision. I um, felt the, uh, that I couldn't see my child because the prison conditions for women, we always uh, reported them, were so much more difficult than those for men. For example, we didn't have the right uh, to uh, have family, uh, interviews with our family members within the same space. We were separated by two screens. 
And so it was also very difficult for me to endure prison without being able to hold and kiss my son when he came to see me um, being so young. Um, but uh, the rest of it um, was taken with a, with a very strong fighting spirit because in reality our activism and the activism of the Sandinistas in general at that time was just full of heroism, of mysticism, of values, of self-sacrifice. It was a time when our best qualities as human beings came out. And can you tell me about your transition from military to civilian life? Um, yes, it was also kind of difficult because immediately after the triumph of the revolution, um, personally for me and talking um, to some other friends of mine, they said that I had been, um, I had assumed a much more radical position in rebuilding my family life. For example, I immediately took my son with me. There were um, comrades who let several years go by and afterward it really affected their relationships with their children whom they had had to leave behind or whom they had given birth to um, while underground. But on the other hand, our, our life in the 80s continued being difficult because immediately a new chapter of war was open and this changed um, the revolution's initial plans and it imposed certain conditions that um, made things more difficult. Even the um, democratic functioning of the Sandinista Front um, was difficult, a more um, relaxed life. But in the middle of all of this, we made the transition. Um, we rebuilt our family life. I had another daughter in 1980, for example. And um, I, I reestablished ties with my mother. All of my sisters had actively participated. I, um, I lost a sister um, who was 16 years old. I don't uh, have, I don't have a, a photo of her here, which is strange. I don't, I, I don't have a photo of her. Um, and another one of my sisters who was only 15 years old had a bomb explode um, in front of her and, and she lost both her hands. And my mother and another sister of mine was imprisoned and others went underground. So the whole family was spread out. Uh, so the reconstruction implied um, a reunion of the whole family. We were all very involved, and, and this really helped. We, we didn't have a big split that some family members belonged to the other side, as it happened with um, many of my compañeras, um, for example. And, and I think that, um, well, that rebuilding daily life was a more or less um, slow process, and at the same time, very fast from a certain point of view. Um, yeah. I, I had four children. I, I mean, after the, the two children with my first husband, um, I then remarried, and I had two more children. And then with those two children, these two uh, last children, I was able to dedicate myself and to be more of a mother. The first two were more affected, and still today they show it in their temperament and um, their insecurity. The other two were, were they, they were attended to more. I gave them more time. Did you take a post immediately after the war? Uh, yes, um, they gave us a recognition that was only given to three women in the whole Sandinista front um, of guerrilla 
combatant. And that was linked to history, to the trajectory, but in a particular way of having occupied military leadership roles during the final months of the offensive. And after that, I, um, I was at the head of the Department of Organization and Work for the masses in 1980, 81, and part of 82. And then in 82, I was named Minister of Regional Affairs. Um, it's a position that I occupied until the end, until 1990 in charge of the processes of decentralization of the organization of local and municipal power. Um, and that's where my vocation for municipality and territory work emerged. In some way, it had to do with the experience that I had accumulated as an organizer. I consider myself a good organizer. And this was the work that I com that I completed in, in, in the 80s. Who were the other two women? That were who were the other two women who were appointed posts? Dora Maria Tellez and Leticia Herrera. Leticia, I think, is now consul in in Panama. Um, she, she she was the shyest of us three. Um, later, I think that there were more women with those merits, but I think that machismo prevailed. Mm -hmm. They awarded this uh, rank of guerrillera comandante, uh, guerrero comandante to um, 30 men and only three women. And what did you do after your work with the ministry in the 80s? And what did you do after your work with the ministry in the 80s? Uh, in, um, in the 80s, my work was uh, to travel throughout the whole country and to organize the presence of the state or of the government in the different territories um, and to favor a horizontal territorial functioning that would, uh, that would favor a less centralized structure than what we had inherited from uh, Somocismo. Uh, the country was just so centralized. Everything was decided on a national level, and um, it was fundamental to reveal the protagonism from the Basses. The municipality had also become very debilitated. So I promoted um, the new municipal law, uh, the municipal autonomy. Um, we created an agency, an institution of municipal promotion. And this allowed me to once again be in contact with the, the people. Did you link that work you were doing with the government to your interest in social change? Of course, of course, because we wanted uh, the purpose, what motivated us to join the armed struggle was the social situation of the people. And we, we dreamed, and, and we, we continue to dream, I, I must say, of a more just society. The social differences um, were so marked back then, and the revolution, despite all of um, the difficulties it has had, was able to develop social programs that diminished um, inequality, that gave peasants and, and women peasants access, uh, even though not enough, uh, to land, um, access to education, access to health care, uh, to social wellness, uh, centers of child development, and we were able to develop our feminism because while we were fighting, we didn't have enough consciousness that uh, in addition to the general rights of people, we were also fighting for our rights as women. I had some initial contacts uh, before going underground 
um, with, the, with the field of feminism uh, through some readings. But um, but we couldn't really develop it, uh, except for a few gestures here and there that uh, were actually more of an instinctive nature. Uh, for example, when I had recently gone underground, there was a compañero who wanted me to wash his clothes. Um, and so I told him I didn't go underground to wash people's clothes. <laughs> and he was really upset because he was an important leader. He was Commander Pedro Arau Palacios. And so he told me, well, we don't consider women to have fewer rights. But you understand that I cannot uh, be seen washing my clothes in this uh, house's yard because th this was a country house because um, they will immediately notice something strange because for campesino, peasant men and women, men don't wash. So I reflected on this and finally I said, fine, I'll wash it for you. <laughs> But he was already really upset, and he told me, no, 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 don't wash it. So I said, well, fine then. Um, and I joined with the decision to take full responsibility and to complete all the tasks without distinction for my sex. There was a moment um, during military training, um, and I was there with a comrade who is today, she is a vice fiscal leader of the country, Ana Julia Guido. Um, and there was a moment in which the exercise we were doing were very violent. Um, and so I started to try to to make a, a smaller effort. And so she turns and tells to me, the men are going to say that women can't do enough. And so she said to me, you can do more squats. Um, I know you can exercise harder, but you're taking advantage of uh, being a, a woman, of your condition as a woman, because when the compañero would see that I was tired, he would say, oh, you can stop, you can rest. And so later I thought about it and I said, yeah, yeah, it's true. If we want to display our full abilities, we can't pretend to be weak because in reality, I was pretending to be weak. I could do more, a harder effort. Um, so these were the thoughts that we would have. But it wasn't until after the ri revolution triumphed that we had the opportunity to um, collectively and within the women's organization to really come into contact with feminism, um, with the organizations that, that came to Nicaragua. And it wasn't until then that we started to think about our rights, about our historically unequal conditions, um, and about the need to fight for women's rights. Um, even though for many compañeras, there were some of us who put um, our own rights um, beneath the general rights of people and the general interests of the revolution. Because during the revolution, many of our struggles were postponed because we would say the revolution comes first. For example, when we started to debate the theme of abortion about uh, a woman's right to decide about her body, uh, the topic of violence against women, many of those um, topics were postponed. Even in um, even in the party's activism, uh, military activism, they did not demand early on that women's rights were also part of our private lives. Um, so there were occasions where we knew that compañeros, military com activist compañeros, were beating their partners, their female partners. So some of us 
said, well, we have to establish within our statutes that no uh, revolutionary, uh, no Sandinista military activist is allowed to hit his woman, or that they should have personal practices that were governed by respecting our rights. But it was a battle that uh, was developed very timidly. And those of us who had leadership responsibilities didn't give enough support um, to the battles that were started by some of our compañeras and which sometimes resulted in them facing sanctions um, or discrimination. Mm, we, we must say it uh, with all honesty. I think that the electoral defeat of the Sandinista Front opened a larger space uh, for radicalism in within our feminist position. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by feminism? I think it's uh, to have a consciousness. For me, being a feminist is being conscious of the subordinate condition of women in society and to understand the reasons, the historic reasons that have led us to this subordination and inferiority as far as our rights and um, harassment. And not only to be conscious, being feminist for me is to fight to change the situation of discrimination and inequality that women continue to live and that have very concrete agendas in uh, in our in, in economics, in politics, in power relationships, um, in the struggle for a secular state, um, and uh, in in the in the rights of women to control their own body, of her own reproduction, her reproductive role. Do you call yourself a feminist? Yes, I consider myself a feminist. Are you able to do that publicly without consequences? Yeah, we suffer. There are um, social consequences. Well, um, we are seen by one sector of society uh, as um, transgressive women. We transgress the existing morality. Um, if we talk about a woman's right to make decisions about her own body, some disqualify us as murderers. Yeah? For example, just for, just for defending the right for therapeutic abortion, which is it's um, the uh, abortion or the interruption of pregnancy that has to do explicitly with the life of the woman, with the right of a woman to interrupt a pregnancy when her own life is at risk. And some accuse us of being murderers. They yell at us, murderers. Uh, if you claim the right to free sexual relations, uh, they call you promiscuous. Or they call us uh, lesbians, uh, we, even if we aren't. Um, so, uh, it's, you know, what I mean is, even though we explain, we claim the right to sexual relations uh, without discrimination, but immediately there is a, uh, a very strong social pressure. I'm going to take you back to your story. Can you tell me what you did after the electoral defeat in 1990? Um, in 1990, I was elected as a counselor. 
and it was an exceedingly disadvantageous situation. We made a tough law, <laughs> and the tough law was then applied to us, because even though we got 40% of the votes, we only had four councillors out of 20. So these four councillors, um, we had to uh, we we had to be the opposition in the municipal council. And to be completely frank, um, the person who had a very outstanding role uh, during that period uh, from 1990 to 97 was me. Um, the others had a much more, there were three men, a much more timid role. I began to fight against the corruption um, that uh, the, the mayor, Arnoldo Alemán, implemented. The mayor then was Arnoldo Alemán, and he began to steal communal funds to build his party. And I began to show, um, I, was, I was more known as Monica Valtodano in the 1990s than in the 1980s, because I was in the papers all every day denouncing the acts of corruption, and I even I legally accused, judicially accused Arnoldo Aleman. So then um, I continued working uh, with the Sandinista Front, and I became very well known in um, in the ranks as someone who did not stop fighting. I mean, I continued uh, to have a very confrontational position uh, in the struggle, um, in the new conditions when we were now out of power. And uh, that's why later we were able to, to get um, deputies and we received the recognition um, of even those who don't share our political positions and who don't share our ideological positions, but they recognize that Monica Valtodano has been a pugnacious woman who defends her points of view uh, passionately, energetically, without fear. And she, con she confronts, I confront adversity um, with a characteristic that I have, uh, according to my mother, I've had since I was very young. Um, because I loved taking risks. I loved to uh, climb the roof, um, to see, uh, well, let's say, the, the perspective of my, my barrio from a different perspective, even though I could have fallen and split my head open. So it seems like I had certain tendencies towards courage and risk, and I've maintained this character until today. I'm a little controversial in some ways, um, because I'm, I'm either very loved or very hated, because uh, I have a hard time finding the middle gro ground in things. So then this is how I continued developing my profile after our loss. Um, and this was during very difficult conditions, very difficult. For most of your life, you took these risks as a supporter of the FSLN. But then something shifted for you. Can you tell me a bit about what went into your starting the MRS? Well, um, to clarify um, that I, I didn't participate in the MRS. Um, the MRS was founded in 1995, and I had a radically different position. You could say that um, the Congress of 1994 um, was where confrontations between the leanings of the MRS and the leading uh, the leanings of my group, which was the Democratic Left, and in some ways we were fundamental uh, for Daniel Ortega to remain as Secretary General in 1994. Um, we had very strong differences with uh, the MRS. We shared their uh, democratic ideals about democratizing the Sandinista Front, 
but we did not share certain um, ideological leanings toward the center in terms such as imperialism, um, to be a leftist or not. For example, they pleaded for us uh, to not continue declaring ourselves anti-imperialists. So I didn't share their ideological agenda. And I continued within the Sandinista front, driving it, uh, but fighting from the inside for the democratic ideals, uh, for the participation of women, for example. I consider myself to be the creator of um, some of the changes that happened and um, we, that where we were able to obtain the 30% quota and then the 40% quota. But the break, uh, the actual break uh, with the current Sandinista leadership was, um, well, it began to manifest itself in 1998 when Daniel Ortega, um, after he was being accused of rape. Um, this was a part of, part of the leadership um, accused me of being responsible for it. In reality, I had nothing to do with um, Soil America's decision to make that complaint. But they needed to justify um, her report um, with a plot. And there was an accusation that I was responsible. Um, after uh, that uh, accusation, Daniel began to turn the Sandinista front towards a policy of transactions, of agreements, of arrangements with Arnoldo Alemán. And I radically opposed to that. And as deputy, and being bound by the statutes uh, to vote for the consti constitutional reforms that um, Ortega and Aleman had created, I voted against them. There were only four of us who opposed, two women and two men. And this meant uh, being um, sanctioned by the Sandinista Front. Um, so that's to say that they excluded me. I could no longer be candidate for deputy. They sanctioned me. They took disciplinary actions. And um, so then they left me without a single task. And I began to work in social movements, trying to build independent social movements. We were against the privatization, so we were uh, making connections with other movements. I became I, in contact with um, social movements in the South, with the movement of the landless, with the Zapatista movement. And I began to work with the social movements. I mean, I didn't belong to the partisan structures anymore. So I began to, um, to connect a lot more with um, social movements. And doing this work, was how the movi movement to reclaim Sandinismo began. There is a, a small confusion because it has the same initials. A and I want to say here that the renovation movement that was founded in 1995 entered into an alliance with Daniel Ortega in 2001 and formed part of what was called the Convergence, which is how Daniel Ortega participated in the elections of 2001. And the movement to reclaim convinced the renovation movement. It's the same acronym, but one is reclaim and the other is renew. The renovation movement had legal entity status, so then we made an alliance to participate in the 2006 elections, and that is how I became a deputy. But I have never been active in the renovation party, and I still have certain slight differences with them. We could say that they are more centrist, and I consider myself more of a leftist. 
Um, so then um, these differences also manifest themselves in the movement to reclaim. The movement to reclaim is, um, we'll say, it didn't want to ally itself with the ALN or with Monte Alegre because we consider it to be a right-wing alliance um, and we have certain differences. So then um, I aligned myself with the movement to reclaim um, but this happened in 2005, right after um, it was founded. They invited me to support them, and they immediately gave me the responsibility of Managua to organize Managua was a very important task. And later they nominated me to uh, be candidate for deputy. But I'm a deputy of the movement to reclaim. It's a slightly different movement. Can you, tell us Can you tell us briefly about the position that you hold now, the job that you're working in, and what kind of issues you're trying to address? And what kind of issues you're trying to address? In Parliament, my central agenda has been linked to the struggle for women's rights. And we have been able to convince women of different ideologies to become involved in this fight. We have proposed the family code, the um, decriminalization of therapeutic abortion, the law for sexual and reproductive rights, which has to do a lot with education. We are on the topic of breast cancer, women's rights in relation to illnesses that affect them in particular. But my central task um, is in the organization of the movement to reclaim. Um, in the training of new leaders, youth, and in the struggle for democracy. Because uh, the ascent of Daniel Ortega to government in 2006 was accompanied by a series of actions that were clearly directed at, uh, to control the country. Um, an absolute control. He now controls the powers that should be independent, um, judicial power, the electoral power, the um, National Finance Office, um, the National Assembly. And so uh, he has unfolded a plan to uh, autocratically control all of the government's offices along with his wife. And with this plan, he has uh, pushed aside the law, the Constitution of the Republic, um, the civil and political rights of, uh, of all Nicaraguans that don't think like him. He has organized groups to attack us. Uh, so then for us who fought against a dictatorship and who know uh, Nicaragua's history, we see that he is constructing a dictatorship. A dictatorship is under construction. I'm going to have to take a break just to call my friend to tell her that I'm on my way. Monica, what year did you take your position in Parliament? Uh, I was deputy from 97 until 2002. Um, that's when I voted against the uh, constitutional reforms of the pact. I was deputy uh, with the Sandinista Front. Later, I had a period without uh, where I was not um, deputy, and then I was elected again in 2006, and my term um, ends in 2012.
it ends in 2012. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have one more question. So I have one more question. Several women, Several women who are as outspoken as you are, who also take risks, have talked about being blacklisted. How are you able to take risks and speak out against Ortega and successfully hold a position in Parliament? How are you able to take risks and speak out against Ortega? ¿Cómo has logrado hablar y tomar estos riesgos y hablar en contra de Ortega? And successfully hold a position in Parliament. Y exitosamente tomar, uh, mantener una posición en el Parlamento. Bueno. Well, um, well, first, I have always been active in one movement or another and joining um, other people, men, women, uh, who have the same positions. They haven't been positions um, that I've had uh, as uh, alone. Um, so that gives me some level of strength. And later, um, we have suffered the consequences of our positions. But when we have suffered repression, we have reported them. We have not stayed quiet. We have not shown fear. Uh, fear. Actually, we have said, we are not afraid of you. A and we report everything that happens. For example, um, this foundation in, uh, in several occasions has been subjected to plans uh, using the judicial power to uh, annul, uh, for example, our ownership of this property. Uh, sometimes they have made up cases uh, in order to take us to court and we've reported them uh, nationally and internationally as well. And, and we have said, you are not going to break us with fear. But we have also tried to be sure that our lives do not depend on a job, on a salary, um, but we've tried to construct um, self-sufficiency uh, that gives us autonomy because when people blacklist you from work, they close off. Um, it's understandable sometimes that they begin to be quiet or they um, to stop fighting. Um, and additionally, we have always confronted this as a family. We have passed through difficult times um, economically. And for example, I will stop being a deputy, but just because I'm not going to have that income, um, I'm not going to stop feeling that I don't have things to fight for. I mean, our struggle doesn't depend on appointments, on positions. Um, in my family, we say we are willing to go hungry to live with um, difficulties um, in order to confront whatever comes our way. And since we already lived, um, we already had a very tough life, we say uh, we can do anything. And hopefully it isn't necessary for um, the country to again become involved in an armed conflict because we don't want it. And that's why we say we must be aggressive and fight through civil channels peacefully using nonviolence to achieve um, a country so that our country does not fall again into a dictatorial regime. Do you also collaborate with the Women's Autonomous Movement when you're addressing women's rights issues? Yes, um, yes. We feel that we are part of the autonomous movement. We interact with them uh, on all the plans um, 
and we work together. And, and uh, when I talk about the autonomous movement, uh, th there is a movement that's called the autonomous movement, but we also refer to um, the women who are simply organized in the struggle against violence, the collectives, the group that is promoting the decriminalization of the therapeutic abortion. Um, we interact with all of them. And in the last few years, we have developed the best relationships um, that we didn't have uh, so much stronger than the ones we had with the feminist movement. Monica, I know you have another appointment, so I just want to close by telling you that it is an honor that you would meet with us today. Do you have time for Ansil to take Thank a you. professional photograph with you? Yeah, sure, yes, of course. And there's so much history on this wall. And there is so much history on this wall. Después 